You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 19, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, innate immunity. Our presenter is Dr. Christina Chacho. She's in the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Welcome to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, Today is is November 19, 2012. Uh, This is a Monday and we're uh, joined today by uh, Dr. Christina Chacho who's going to continue the ongoing series on immunology. Dr. Chacho, as you know, is the immunology professor and we all appreciate the series that you put on, Dr. Chacho. <clears throat> so, do we have a quorum already? Is everybody here? Yeah, I think she's going to be on an admission, so she oh, okay. will be here as soon as she Well, very good. Um, and after we're done, um, a little bit later at 11 o'clock Central Time, uh, Dr. Ron Nicholas is going to join us, and he's going to tell <laughs> us about telemedicine, which is how you can see patients uh, at a distance, which I think will be very interesting. I, I've always thought that that was uh, the kind of the future of, of medical care where you can see each other on screens, telepresence, we're doing it right right now. Why can't we uh, expand this into the realm of uh, patient care? So, but, but before we uh, get to telemedicine, we're going to learn about immunology. So I'm going to turn the podium over to Dr. Judge. Take it away. All right. Um, so this chapter has a lot of stuff in it. Um, and a lot of detail to remember. So again, first years, try not to get bogged down by all the detail in it, but to try and kind of get the broad concept. In this case, we're talking about innate immunity, and a lot of the um, chapter is devoted to this idea of pattern recognition receptors. Um, so just understanding what a pattern recognition receptor is and the fact that they are everywhere. They're using the, um, um, floating around in our blood, uh, they're on every cell, they're inside cells, they're everywhere. Um, outside of that, a lot of it is just kind of getting to know the nomenclature. All right, so innate immunity in general is the first line of defense against infections. It mediates, um, I'm sorry, the mediators of innate immunity exist in fully functioning states prior to antigen. So unlike B and T cells, where there actually has to be um, a rearrangement for them to work, innate immunity exists ready to go um, at any moment. Um, The innate immune system prevents, controls, and eliminates infection. It recognizes products of damaged and dead host cells to eliminate cells and initiate tissue repair in addition to just fighting infection. And it stimulates the adaptive immune response and influences the nature of um, the response. Obviously, it's a very important part of of the immune system. So recognition. Uh, Most of the innate immune system recognizes things um, by looking at um, the molecular structure that is characteristic of microbial pathogens, but not just pathogens, but also, say, cancerous cells. Um, This is done by recognition uh, of these receptors called PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So there are certain patterns that are unique to pathogens, like double-stranded RNA, unmethylated CPG DNA, LPS. I wouldn't worry too much about what all these things mean is becoming um, comfortable uh, remembering that they are something that is characteristic of a pathogen. And typically, the pattern that is being recognized um, is essential for that microbe to survive. In other words, they can't mutate to then evade um, the innate immune system. These things are essential and um, are on a lot of pathogens. Um, so like I said, the recognition is not just 
pathogens, but you can also recognize endogenous molecules produced by damaged cells. And these are recognized by what we call damage-associated molecular patterns, or DAMPs. So PAMPs and DAMPs are uh, what the innate immune system uses to initially recognize that something's wrong um, before it started. So a lot of these receptors use pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs, um, to recognize these things. So pattern recognition receptor recognizes exactly that. It's usually a repeating pattern. Again, something that is typically just on um, microbes or something that is just on damaged cells. So these pattern recognition receptors are encoded in the germline DNA. Of course, that's what makes it part of the innate immune system as opposed to the adaptive immune system. Nothing needs to adapt. It's encoded in germline DNA. Um, so there's a table for three on page 59 of the Abbas text. It shows um, all different kinds of pattern recognition molecules in the innate immune system, a lot of which we're going to at least briefly mention today um, and go over oh, what they do. But all these different things are in lots of different locations um, all throughout the body. They're ubiquitous. Um, and they um, are going to be what the fighting infection and keep damaged cells at bay and um, out of the body. So um, we will talk a lot about these pattern recognition receptors um, as if they were on a antigen presenting cell, but they are ubiquitously expressed. So remember, anything can be an antigen presenting cell. These are on neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells. They're on almost every cell of the body, if not every cell of the body. I'm not sure something like red blood cell would have them, but they are, they are everywhere. This is figure 4.1. It's on page 58 of Abbas, and it just kind of shows um, some basic examples. The toll-like receptors we're going to actually spend a little bit of time on. Uh, toll-like receptors can be um, on the inside or outside of cells. Um, they recognize pattern. Um, there are something called lectins that we're going to talk a little bit about um, that recognize fungal polysaccharides, um, RLRs, recognize viral um, RNA, NLRs, recognize bacterial bacteria. So I think this is actually um, the table to 4.3 from page 59, but an older version. They didn't put the tables back up, unfortunately. Uh, onto the uh, website for the textbook. Um, but all these things, are you, you second years definitely need to start getting a handle on um, what they do because they're going to be a very, very important part of your board's exam. So the first one we're going to talk about is toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors um, are loved by allergists. And the reason is toll-like receptor um, probably play an important role in the pathogenesis of allergic disease. For example, we know that um, if TLR4 does not signal because a, a variant, a genetic variant, um, you are more likely to um, develop allergic disease. Hence, toll-like receptors are covered quite a bit on our boards. So toll-like receptors are um, made of a leucine-rich ligand binding domain. So leucine, remember, it's just an amino acid. It's nothing to get excited about. But it's just saying that there's this um, uh, extracellular, well, not exactly extracellular, but um, the binding part of the toll-like receptor is this leucine-rich domain. Um, and then there is the toll IL-1 receptor uh, homology domain for signaling. We call it the TER homology domain, and that part's for signaling. So toll-like receptor is basically made up of two important parts, the part that binds to whatever it's trying to get at, and then the part that starts signaling. We know of nine, I, it actually may be 10 now, maybe 11. There are at least nine toll-like receptors in the human body that we know of, and nine covered in the Abbas text. On page 61, we see figure uh, 4.2 um, that shows the location of the different toll-like receptors. So um, 
toll-like receptor 1, 2, 4, 5, 6 are all extracellular and are going to bind to things that you would expect to be on the outside of the cell, like things that are found on the wall of a bacteria. 3, 7, 8, 9 are intracellular. They're in the endosome, and they recognize things that you would not ex expect to be expressed or exposed until the cell's been broken down a little bit or partially digested. So things like RNA and DNA. So this is the first high yield fact that I would definitely memorize, um, second years, that 3, 7, 8, and 9 are the toll-like receptors that are intracellular. And then it's pretty easy to uh, <laughs> remember that the rest are on the outside. Um. Um, uh, this may have, uh, again, kept it in because I liked it better from the old version, so I'm not sure it's in this um, version of the Abbas. But the next thing you need to memorize is what all of these TLRs actually bind to. So TLR4 binds to LPS. We hear about that one a lot. The gel in TLR5. Um, 3789 I always find fairly easy to remember um, because of the things that you do not expect to be seen until the um, cells broken down a little bit. Um, unmethylated CPG DNA is a CLR9, single-stranded RNA7 and 8, double-stranded RNA3. It's important to know that TLR2 uh, is dimerized with two other TLRs, TLR6 and TLR1. Um, those are the things I would start to look at. Before the boards, you also have to kind of look at the in-depth list. So we, I often um, think of LPS as the main ligand for TLR4, but in reality it also recognizes things like heat shot proteins, um, viral envelope proteins, um, other things. You really need to know the whole list. In fact, they probably won't ask you about LPS because that one's too easy. Where is that table from? Season? I think this is the old box, okay. and I just kept it in because so I like it. Can I clarify? Because in the text it says that, which I thought that LPS was for, but in the text it says... You did. You got that too? Okay. TLR2 is LPS and 4 is lipotechoic acid, but that's the right one right there, right? Lipotechoic acid is 2. Okay. Uh, and those are different, is what I want to clarify. Yeah. The table is really similar. It's just set up different. And it says TLR4 is LPS. Right. Yeah, TLR4 yeah, is LPS. Yeah, but it's the opposite. So so no, yeah, it sounds in the text as well. Yes. If you look on what page? 60, the last paragraph um, on the... Uh, yeah, you guys may be putting more credibility in something that really hasn't been solidly fed yet. Um, oh, I see. You see the like, yeah, yeah, such as uh, it's better it's respect, you know, yeah. I think they were quite the first of that, right? Um, yeah. Okay, but we should remember L TLL four, and we should just yeah. That's it. That that table has more detail. <laughs> Yeah, and there's more to come out on these, too. Oh, yeah. This is an emerging field. I, I think okay. TLF4, though, is one to really have down because that's the one that's okay. really being intensely investigated in the pathogenesis of allergy. Although, yes, Dr. Barnes, I agree with you that there's a lot to learn. I can't think of the, the large group, this TLF4 group. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're very influential, and so TLF4 is going to be the answer to a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> TLF4. So, um, so what happens? The, this bind, remember the leucine-rich um, binding domain gets bound to a pattern that it recognizes. Um, and then it starts this cascade of proteins um, that phosphorylate and activate all the way into the nucleus. And then it's going to cause something to change, like um, upregulation of costamentary molecules, um, expression of different cytokines. But the signal is going to tell the nucleus what it's going wants the cell to now change and do in response to the fact that there is an invader around it or there is a um, heat shock protein, you know, uh, something in this uh, nearby environment has been damaged and the cell has to do something about it. 
Okay, so this is the next um, high yield fact. This is figure four three from page um, sixty two. So as far as we know, all the TLRs signal through a very similar cascade that is mediated by something called MyD88. So they're MyD88 dependent signaling. Okay, except for TLR3. TLR3 is always MyD88 independent. TLR4 has a choice. It may, it can signal through MyD88, but it can also signal in an alternative pathway. So they're all the same except for three and four. Three. TLR3 is necessarily MyD88 independent, whereas TLR4 can do either. A MyD88 independent or dependent pathway. So this is the whole signaling cascade. Yeah, and again, I think that this is from the old text that I actually even modified a little bit. <laughs> The reason is um, one way you're going to see this um, tested and kind of need to get a sense of um, is uh, the different um, mutations that, are concur that can occur um, in the signaling pathways because a lot of them are associated with different immune deficiencies. So NEMO I added because NEMO is one immune deficiency, immune, NEMO deficiency is one immune deficiency that is really um, well characterized at this point. So same thing, um, TLR3 is signaling through a MyD88 independent manner, um, but it is still signaling through something called NEMO. It's still ending up in this I kappa B um, kinase cascade leading to the same transcription factors like NF kappa B activation. So most of them go through MyD88, they're MyD88 dependent, and then go signal through something called IRAC and IRAC4, both of whose absence is associated with an immune deficiency. Um, and they signal through NEMO to this I kappa B cascade um, or through FOS to activate these transcription factors, NF kappa B and AP1. Okay. Uh, this I pulled down from the internet, which is actually a really great um, signaling pathway, but is uh, mind-boggling. But this has a lot of the different pa pattern recognition receptors and the signaling cascades. Signaling cascades, unfortunately, are something we kind of have to get a handle on. Um, at least some of the um, the broad changes that are made as phosphorylation occurs. Um, but here you can see uh, the TLR is going through MyD88, um, IRAC4, NEMO um, to the transcription factors. This is hard to see on this, but it's worth um, printing out and taking a look at because I do think it's very well laid out. Okay, so the immune deficiencies, if you have a NEMO or ICAPA B deficiency, you tend to have ectodermal dysplasia with immune deficiency, where you are prone to infections of pyogenic bacteria and mycobacteria. If the mutation's in MyD88, then you have pyogenic bacteria and mycobacteria, but I believe that's in the absence of ectodermal dysplasia. Um, IRAC4, pyogenic bacterial infections, you can have UNC93B or TLR3, we have a tendency at HSC encephalitis, and then a TLR4 mutation can lead to um, Neisseria meningitis sepsis. Okay. So the next pattern recognition receptor we're going to talk a little bit about is um, nod-like receptors. Um, so similarly, nod-like receptors um, have this leucine-rich binding domain and it has a signaling domain, but it also has a third domain um, called not, um, I think it's notched, N-A-C-H-T, and this third domain is used so these um, receptors can bind to each other. They bind to each other and they 
create something called an inflammasome. These are intracellular and they are very important in noticing um, cell damage in addition to infection. Um, but these inflammasomes can be very important in um, cytokine secretion. There are three subfamilies of non-like receptors. Um, and these broad categories um, tell us how the different um, nod-like receptors are going to signal. Uh, so they're CARD, PYRIN, and BUR. These are the broad categories that are going to um, that are going to direct us how these different nod-like receptors, in general, are going to signal. Okay. Why do we need to know these? Because one of them um, was published in the New England Journal in 2009, and it showed a homozygous CARD9 mutation um, found in a family that was susceptible to fungal infection. So whenever immune deficiency is associated with it, it is important to know. OK, so one um, nod-like receptor called NOD2 um, is one that specifically is very important to know. It's highly expressed in PAM cells. And it stimulates expression of defensin. So the defensins are a natural antibiotic. Find something called uromal dipeptide. And mutations in NOD2, you definitely need to know, can lead to Crohn's disease and Glaus syndrome. OK. So there is a non-like receptor um, subfamily called NLRPs that form inflammasomes, which generate IL-1. NLRP3 um, is a form of NLRP that is associated with hereditary fever syndrome um, that can be uh, improved by an IL-1 antagonist. Anakinra, which is also called Kinneret. There's a picture here. It's figured 4 4, page 64, that shows this inflammasome. So here's your uh, nod like receptor. And it has that leucine rich um, binding section, just like a tolerant receptor did, and it has a signaling um, domain. But then it has this third notch domain that is going to allow two nod-like receptors to bind to each other. So remember, we're going to put these um, nod-like receptors into broad categories, one of them being CARD, and that just speaks to how it's going to signal. So this particular example is going to signal through CARD. So you have your nod-like receptor, it's going to signal through CARD. And then it can bind to something called caspase 1. So although we think of the caspases, um, there's something important in, um, in programmed cell death. This particular caspase is very important in generation of IL-1. So you get signaling through the nod-like receptor through many different things, all of which are listed here, could potentially um, start this reaction. You have an inflammasome that's formed. And this inflammasome is going to help in this generation of IL-1 and going to be very important in acute inflammation. And they get not like receptors. OK. Uh, the next one they talk about very briefly are RIG-like receptors, RLRs. Um, RIG-like receptors are cytosolic sensors of viral RNA, and they're very important in the production of type 1 interferons. RIG-like receptors um, are broken down into two broad categories that we know of, RIG-1 and MDA5. Yep. Um, back to the NL NLRs. Uh -huh. We talked about just the card as being one of those categories. Correct. But th did we need to also know about the pyrin and the BIR as well? Yes. I didn't see it in this 
I'm going to come to it. So I have to yeah, so LRP. I think the Pyron, right? Um, yeah. The Pyron domain containing. Yeah, uh, so yes, I think the answer is there. But there's nothing uh, specific with the B, uh, the BIR one that we need to know, like for no, hard, I would just know in the broad category of okay. in signaling of NLR should not be on that. Okay. Um, next type of receptors in the immune system are carbohydrate carbohydrate receptors or lectins, C-type lectins, all the same thing. Um, examples are mannose receptors, which bind the carbohydrate in mannose, just as you would expect. Dectins are pattern recognition receptors for fungal organisms. Um, different types <laughs> of dectin include DC sign, um, and DC sign is important because it actually may help in the promotion of HIV-1 infection. Um, I, don't, I don't have a good lecture on HIV um, in this course. I probably should get one up and going. Um, but knowing um, what receptors it exploits to become infective I think is actually very important. Um, so DC sign on dendritic cells. We actually use it as a dendritic cell marker as well. Okay. Next, scavenger receptors. So scavenger receptors um, are very important in uh, chemo attraction. So this particular uh, example, N formal metlu C receptors mediate the uptake of oxidized lipoproteins. That's how they are first characterized. Some examples are this um, FPR and FPRL1. So we kind of think of these as receptors that sniff. So they have a ligand that they sort of sniff out and become a chemoattractant. So it's attracting two things together. So if there is a problem in this system, something that has been associated with it are aspis ulcers. And there is actually an assay you can do where you look at um, this metlu sniffing or metlu effectiveness when you are um, working up aspis ulcers if it doesn't seem like they have something like um, they shut. Is that similar to that, like, I guess it's the same, like the FNET we talked about when we talked about Tempirac and the like rolling and um, integrin ligand and like the rolling hopping. We talked yeah. about that. It's like one of the chemoattractive. Exactly. Same thing. Exactly. 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 Do we do that here? Mm, like or is it an outcome? Outcome. Outcome. We have a patient that has Oh, like, no, it's not even a commercially available. It's oh, it's a research thing. Okay. And it won't necessarily change your management. I mean, there's nothing to go to these diseases that you can treat? Um, I don't know that there is. Just kind of wanted to give you an answer to why. Yeah. I, yeah. Last time. I almost yeah. sent it once, but in the meanwhile, the person I was seeing with the SSL just got treated with um, steroids and got better, Yeah. which so made it much less infective and much more likely kind of autoimmune. That's kind of how ours was. Okay. So. So if you're concerned in a patient with aspis ulcers, mm -hmm. you would think of all other things, but this is like a deformity in that particular receptor has been seen to be associated with that? Exactly. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Aspis ulcers can be tough. There's a lot of them that yeah. you never really get to a great <laughs> But this is something that people are playing around with. Okay, so those are the receptors of the innate immune system. Um, so it's kind of, there's, a, there's a lot of detail on that that is good to remember. Um, but first year is just kind of knowing the broad category. Starting to know some of those basic um, high yield points of toll-like receptors is important, but you'll get those. We'll do those to death and jeopardy. Um, but the basic overall concept is very easy, that they recognize these repeating patterns, pattern recognition receptors. And the patterns are important for the survival of whatever it's recognizing. They can't mutate. They can't go away. That's why how the innate immune system stays effective. 
All right, uh, so let's talk about some cells of the innate immune system. The first uh, being epithelial cells, epithelial barrier. So of course, this is actually a physical barrier to the outside, and that is um, one of the most important functions for epithelial cells. But sometimes we lose sight of the fact that it does very important things like create mucus um, to sweep away um, things that we don't want in our bodies. It also produces antimicrobial agents like defensins and catalyst season. So the skin can actually be upregulated to secrete things like defensins and catalyst sedans, which are very effective in killing off bacteria-like um, staph infections. But in the same way, there are things like staph epi, which we clinically tend to just blow off when we see it because it's not virulent. In and actually causes epithelial cells to upregulate things like defensins and catholicidins. So the catch-22 that we run into is that as we try and um, take all the microbes off our skin to fight things like a staph infection, we are also downregulating things like defensins and catholicidins, which is our natural way of fighting off staph infections. So. Hopefully, in the future, we will be able to come up with some methods that can selectively kill off pathogenic bacteria, uh, but maintain some of our natural flora to maintain um, our natural levels of defenses and cathelicines. OK. That's just my aside. We don't use antiseptics. <laughs> just have to be cognizant of how much antiseptic we are using and what we are doing as a result. You know, you're, you're I do get my names head. that are acronyms of other acronyms. In other words, you know, the what the R L uh, R I G is rig like I mean R L R's are rig like receptors, but rig is an acronym itself. I haven't been able to find out that. <laughs> Yeah, learning immunology is learning a new language, that's for sure. Um, OK, and also the epithelial cells um, contain, or the epithelial barrier anyway, contains lymphocytes that are part of the innate immune system um, that don't rearrange and um, are really more like innate immune cells than they are adaptive immune cells. So this is figure 4-5 on page 67. Again, it just goes over the jobs of the epithelial barrier. Of course, it's a physical barrier. It's very good at secreting antibiotics. And it contains um, lymphocytes with a limited repertoire that uh, act as innate cells and not adaptive cells. Um, so uh, one of the most important cells in the innate immune system that we've actually already read a lot about because of the Sempirac text uh, really hones in on these are phagocytes. The phagocytes, are, of course, are cells that eat, including macrophages and neutrophils. So, of course, in the initial um, innate reaction, uh, a macrophage will sense through a pattern recognition receptor, uh, will sense an invasion, and then will phagocytose. But macrophages are in limited numbers in our epithelium. Um, and when they need help, they call in neutrophils, which can be made very quickly. Um, which come in and phagocytose and they eat, die, and become pus. Um, that's not their only job, however, but they can really direct the, um, the whole immune reaction by once they have recognized an invader through the pattern recognition receptors, of course, they signal and cytokines can also be produced um, that are really going to direct other cells in what to do. They're also important in um, repairing damaged tissue once the whole fight is over. So dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are a very important part of the innate immune system and really um, direct uh, what's happening in the rest uh, as the immune system gets kicked off. There are different types of dendritic cells, which I think I've mentioned before already this year. Uh, myeloid dendritic cells, 
plasmacytes, otoid dendritic cells, Langerhans dendritic cells, and interstitial dendritic cells. Langerhans dendritic cells are the ones that we kind of traditionally think of as starting the immune response. They contain Burbeck granules, those little things that look like tennis rackets. They're from a myeloid progenitor. They're found in the epidermis, and they are the ones that are excellent antigen presenting cells. Myeloid dendritic cells are really more important in phagocytosis than they are in cytokine, uh, cytokine secretion, interferon secretion. But plasmacytoid dendritic cells, which actually come from a different precursor, a lymphoid precursor, are more important in secreting interferon than they really are in participating in phagocytosis. One way I think you can try and remember this is if you think of lympho, um, lymphocytes, you really Lymphocytes are very important in cytokine secretion, so something that comes from the same progenitor um, is going to be very important in cytokine, cytokine secretion. Things with myeloid um, progenitor are more important in phagocytosis. Maybe a way to remember that a little bit. Um, interstitial dendritic cells, I guess, would be um, would kind of blow that out of the water because they come from myeloid progenitor and they're important in production of IL-10, which of course calms down the immune system. Um, but also can activate B cells. <clears throat> All right, so other cells in the immune system, of course, NK cells. They can perform a killing function without the need for clonal expansion and differentiation. They express CD16 and CD56 on their cell surface. That's how we can tell they are NK cells. They do not um, express CD3. So they are regulated by a balance of activating and inhibitory receptors. This is one of the most important parts about NK cells that's mentioned in this chapter. So it's going to receive, probably at any interaction with the cell, a whole bunch of different receptor ligand interactions. Some are going to be activating, some are going to be inhibitory. And depending on which way the balance fits, that's what it's going to decide to do. So one option is that the NK cell goes away, it's screen that cell, it's healthy, it goes to a different cell to look, or if there are enough uh, activating receptors, it's going to tip the balance where the NK cell is actually going to um, do its job and um, and initiate um, program cell death in their target cell. This is a very important point. The survival of NK cells is dependent on IL-15. Why is this important? Because um, the common gamma chain, let's see, the common gamma chain is important um, in cytokine signaling. I don't know if I remember. I think it's 2, 4, um, two four seven nine fifteen and 21, maybe. Those are the cytokines that are affected. So if you, 7, of course, is for T cells, so it's going to be T minus, B positive, NK minus, SCID, the common gamma chain. Um, excellent skid is not going to have NK cells and it's because you can't signal through IL-15, which is essential for cell survival. Okay, so NK cells have, like I mentioned, inhibitory, um, are going to have inhibitory receptors and activating receptors. So inhibitory receptors have an ITIM in the cytoplasmic cell. Um, and not black, but block these block signaling pathways. So the ITIMs recruit phosphatases, and phosphatases remove phosphates, which is going to inhibit the signal. Whereas activating receptors have ITAMs, which promote killing, they recruit kinases, and kinases cause phosphorylation. So phosphatase kinase is a really important um, term to get down early on. A kinase causes phosphorylation. A phosphatase um, removes a phosphate group. <coughs> this is figure 4-6 on page 69 that shows inhibitory receptor being engaged, which is going to send a signal. And of course, if the balance is tipped, that there are more inhibitory receptors um, being activated than activating receptors, and the NK cell decides that this is a normal healthy cell and doesn't do anything. But if it um, has 
um, no inhibitory receptors engaged, or if there's multiple receptors engaged, but the inhibitory um, receptors are outnumbered by activating receptors, and that's going to result in cell death. That's going to be a signal that the cell is infected or a tumor cell. This is figure 4-7 on um, page 70, and it actually has some of the different inhibitory and activating receptors, um, which you do need to eventually memorize, as well, uh, along with their ligands. So activating receptors include CD16 and CRs, um, CUR2DS, not to be confirmed, uh, confused with other CURs that are going to bind to HLAC. Oh, I guess they both bind to HLAC. Mm -hmm. CUR is CUR2. Dr. Orange in the board review book um, does a better chart of the different CUR receptors. Um, this is really pithy knowledge and something that I would probably um, recommend copying the better version from Dr. Orange and the week before the exam, just flat out memorizing. Do we need to know the cytoplasmic signaling subunits mm -hmm. or just the receptor and ligand? Mm -hmm. um, just know it all, that'd be better. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I don't know that I could definitively tell you you wouldn't have to know um, the signaling subunits. Okay. I think you actually probably do need to know at least Broadly, the NKG2A is in the inhibitory receptors that contain ITINs, these purple ITINs as opposed to ITANs. <coughs> That's like and the only inhibitory receptor then. Well, Dr. Orange has a better uh, chart than what I think is here. Um, do you have a copy of the text? They don't have it with yet. The, or do you have it yet? What? I think we told you about a while ago, but it's ordered you for a binder. Yet. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it's a big binder. Yeah. The well, that, that we have? The one that Teresa printed yeah. out for? Yeah. 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 That's the blue group. Okay. Oh, I actually meant the one that they give in Chicago, where they actually get oh, the talk. Wow. Yeah, I don't know if it's in that first date or not. Maybe. Oh, we don't have any of that okay. stuff yet. You, you should be able to order it. It's actually, the, the syllabus is fantastic, but the... Um, what is it called? Can you help us with that? The... Um, it's a it's the board review course. They give it every other you guys, year now. You go, go have it. Yeah, you it's us that doesn't happen. Don't have it. They don't have it's it. Okay, oh, it's like year. every other. It's every other. You'll it's get like it. We have the books. I mean, so it's not this year. Was it last year? Yeah. 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 It's next year. Okay. So how can NK cells function? Um, <coughs> so, so one way that they can kill is something called perforin and granzyme. So perforin actually promotes entry um, into the cell of the granzyme, which is what initiates apoptosis or the programmed cell death. Perforin granzyme. So we're going to talk about this again as the um, apoptosis. Um, but suffice it to say that perforin and granzyme um, are one way which NK cells kill. Okay. Um, other cells in the innate immune system include these lymphocytes that have limited repertoire. We kind of these pop up from chapter to chapter. Um, these include NK T cells, gamma delta T cells, intraepithelial alpha beta T cells, B1 B cells, marginosome B cells. I don't know that there's much to, specific to know about any of these cells, except that when you hear the name, know that it is a, a lymphocyte with a limited repertoire and really part of the innate immune system as opposed to the adaptive immune system. Very limited repertoire means that it doesn't recognize um, a whole host of things like um, adaptive T cells. Adaptive T cells are going to be able to recognize um, you know, millions of different things. These really have very limited um, ability to recognize things in a, that have distinct patterns like pattern recognition receptors do. Mast cells, of course, are very important parts of the innate immune system, so we really used to recognize them as just um, uh, something that is used in a parasitic infection or helminthic infection, um, or we think of an ATP, but they really are becoming better known as an important regulator to the innate immune system. We're beginning to recognize that it actually can secrete a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines um, but I think there's going to be much more to come and the role of mast cells um, 
in the innate root immune response as time goes on. So natural antibodies, um, natural antibodies are produced by B cells with a limited specificity. And they are made without prior exposure to an antigen. They're specific to carbohydrates and lipids. So this is kind of like the lymphocytes we talked about. Um, really what you want to know about natural antibodies is that they are an IgM for the most part. You don't have to be exposed for an antigen for them to be secreted. They're secreted and they act like antibodies, but they, again, they have a very limited repertoire. They can recognize these broad patterns, um, but they can't recognize in much detail. And really, you're not going to get much in the way of a switch over to an IgG. Um, of course, the complement system, one of the most important parts of the innate immune system, but I have a whole lecture devoted to um, the complement system later, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. It can be activated in three ways, the classical pathway where it is activated by antibodies, um, antibodies, the alternative pathway where it's spontaneously um, activated, and of course the lectin pathway, so it recognizes the carbohydrate, the lectin. Um, no matter which way this pathway starts, it all arrives at the same thing that you want to get um, cleavage of C3B in order to get uh, your MAC complex, which is going to put holes in the cell, and the cell is going to um, die because of the gradient that's caused by having holes in the cell wall. OK, so there are soluble, pen, um, soluble pattern recognition receptors that we're going to talk about, like pentractions. Collectins, phycolins. Um, examples of contractions are um, CRP, serum amyloid P, acute phase reactins, and then there's a long contraction called PTX3. All these are very important um, in the inflammatory response. Um, what to know about these. I'm not sure there's much to know about these except uh, that CRP, serum, serum amyloid P, acute phase reactants are all part of these short contractions which are pattern recognition receptors, soluble pattern, rec recept pattern recognition receptors that circulate in the blood. Um, so collectins, phycolins, um, examples of collectins are binding um, lectin. Of course, mannose binding lectin is important in the initiation of um, the complement system. Uh, phycolins, um, if you can look on page 74, I don't think I included it in this lecture, but on page 74, there's figure 410, which um, exemplifies how these things structurally look very similar, so they um, actually have very similar functions. Um, but again, I'm not sure there's much more to know outside of recognizing these things as soluble pattern recognition receptors. Maybe a broad sense of what they do. Okay, so there are certain cytokines that are really associated with the innate response, like TNF, IL-1, and IL-6. Um, one of the most important um, goals in secretion of these cytokines is that it recruits leukocytes to the site of infection. So um, what happens, these cytokines are secreted and the neutrophils and more macrophages are re recruited to the site of infection. They express pattern recognition receptors that recognize microbes. They know that the battle is still on, so they ingest the microbes into the vesicles and they destroy the microbes in the broad sense of what's going on in this reaction. On figure 412, page 79, um, it shows, for example, you have your panic recognition receptor, whatever it may be. This one being a mannose um, receptor being activated, it tells the phagocyte to go ahead and engulf um, that bacteria. That bacteria is engulfed. It's in a phagosome. It fuses with a lysosome. You get a phagolysosome. Within the phagolysosome, what's generated uh, reactive ox oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species, like hydrogen peroxide, are very effective in killing 
um, and killing bacteria. Of course, we mention this again and again because it's associated with a few different immune deficiencies like chronic granulomas disease where you can't generate this oxidative burst, Chedia Kagashi where you get um, these giant phagolysosomes. But I guess the problem is with infusion, I believe, infusion. So, um, I actually forgot this was in here, sorry. Um, this whole response is mediated by this NADPH oxidase, which is made of lots of different parts, GP91 FOX, um, P22, P40, P47, P67. Um, all of these things together make this NADPH oxidase, which of course, the fag also known as the phagocyte oxidase, which is responsible for generation of the reactive oxygen species. All of these subcategories are important um, to know because of chronic granulomatous disease. So it's this GP91 component that's missing in X-linked chronic granulomatous disease, which accounts for 70% of the disease. But then the, there are um, autosomal recessive forms where there's deficiencies or defects in the 22, 47, and 67 FOX, all of which contribute to the same NAD pH oxidase. Um, this is from a different source, but this basically just shows that all these components are part of the NAD pH oxidase system, where you take molecular um, oxide and you make it into superoxide ions. In conjunction with the <coughs> superoxide dismutase, you can generate hydrogen peroxide, which of course is then responsible for actually killing the bacteria inside cells. Uh, all right. Well, there's a little bit at the end, and I'm, I'm going to um, sort of stop here, that talks about the acute inflammatory response, um, which is generated by all these members of the innate immune system. So you have your pattern recognition receptors, which of course are going to generate things um, like these cytokines, which are also known as endogenous pyrogens, which means they increase prostaglandin um, secretion by the hypothalamus, which induces the acute phase reaction, reactants, of course, which are, again, pattern recognition receptors and can actually induce septic shock. This last figure is uh, figure 14 on page 82, which um, kind of shows the systemic reaction and all these different things that these sort of innate cytokines that we think of do in the body in um, innate response. Uh, uh, okay. The um, type 1 interferon is very important in the innate immune response. It's very important in the antiviral response. It activates gene transcription, sequestration of lymphocytes in the node so they have time to actually recognize um, the virus that's going to be presented. It increases NK cytotoxicity, of course, because NK cells are going to be the ones responsible for killing cells that have already been infected by viruses. It upregulates MHC type 1, of course, um, so it can um, present the viruses. Um, figure, figure 415 on page 84 shows the biologic actions of type 1 interferons, all these different, different things that I just mentioned. All right. Um, feedback regulation, quick word, IL-10 we're going to recognize as a down regulator, always a down regulator. IL-1-RA is another down regulator. I think IL-1-RA is actually one that's exclusively mentioned in this chapter. IL-10 we'll see over and over and over and over again. Um, IL-1-RA is a competitive inhibitor of IL-1, um, and thus it can be a, an important in down regulation immune system and uh, feedback regulation. But that's it. Sorry. Um, there's a lot to memorize in this chapter, um, most of which are going to see, again, the very beginning of the pattern receptors. You really will not, but it's very straightforward what you need to know there. It's kind of an overwhelming chapter, isn't it? It's a very overwhelming chapter. It's one of the worst, I think, actually, in the entire book. So we'll have a uh, quiz right after this. Everything you had to learn. <coughs>
you next time.